Good day students, you are welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Physics for Everybody. Today we'll be solving question on 2023 IGCSE Physics 0625 and you are practicing with the specimen paper. Do not forget that these questions are, paper 2 is your multiple choice question and um, is meant for students that are taking the extended examination. But if you are taking core, I suggest you pay attention to this because this will also go a long way in helping you. Now, there are some things that you must take note of when you are taking this new curriculum. This is the curriculum where space physics is introduced newly. Also, this is the, new, this is the curriculum where you use the value of 9.8 as the acceleration due to gravity. So all physics teachers should stop teaching their students to use the approximate value of 10 meters per second square as value of gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth. We always, now we use, um, we don't use 10 anymore, but we use 9.8, that approximate value. Okay, so there are other adjustments, you know, um, space physics has been introduced newly in this curriculum and so many other things that you get to find out along the line. So pay attention throughout this video. Let's go straight to solving questions. Question number one. Question one. A length of string is measured between two points on a ruler. Now this is the ruler, this is the string, and these are the two points between which you take the measurement of the length of string. So when the length of string is wound closely around a pen, it goes round six times. It goes round six times. What is distance once round the pen? You know, if it goes round six times, then how do you get the distance once? You just divide the length by six. Okay? When you divide the length by the number of times this length goes around, then you get the particular length that would go around once. Okay? And that will give you the distance around the pen. So what's the length of this spring? That will be the distance from the beginning to the end. So guess the value you have here, okay, in the beginning, and guess the value on the meter rule at the end, they subtract the value in the beginning from the value at the end. So let us zoom into the screen so as to get the specific value we have in the beginning. You see, this is what we have in the beginning. And what mark is this on the meter rule? You know, this is um, 0 centimeters, 1, 2, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. This is the 2.4 centimeters mark on the meter rule. So you write it here, 2.4. 2.4 centimeters. Now we want to get the value we have at the end of the meter rule, okay? So we do the same thing we did, we zoom in and we pick the value we have here. What do we have here? Um, at this end, this is the value we have. So this 15, 15.1, 15.2, 15.3, 15.4, 15.5.6. So we write the value here as 15.6 centimeters. Then we take the difference between those two, and that will give us the length of the thread. The difference between what and what? The difference between 15.6 and 2.4. 15.6 minus 2.4, that will give us 13.2. 13.2. Now, it is this length of 13.2 that we divide by 6, okay? So we divide our 13.2 by 6. Our answer will be... 2.2, yeah, yeah, 2.2, that should be the length. So A is the correct answer to question number one. We go straight to question number two. You see how easy it is? Yeah, it's always easy, as easy as this. When does an object falling vertically through the air reach terminal velocity? So consider an object of weight W, okay, do not forget that this weight is due to the gravitational field strength on the Earth. Yeah, weight is equal to mass times gravity. So it's gravitational field strength on the Earth that causes um, this weight. So the weight keeps bringing it downwards. But because of the air molecules that are present in the atmosphere, these air molecules introduce a force called drag. And drag would oppose the direction of motion. So this represents the drag on this object. But take note that because of this um, acceleration due to gravity, the weight causes the speed of the object to keep increasing. 
yes, this, the velocity of the object continues to increase. According to this equation, V is equal to U plus AT, okay? According to the first equation of motion, V is equal to U plus AT. But the acceleration in this case is G. That's gravitational field strength of the Earth. So V equals to U plus GT. But this velocity will not continue to increase to this object lands. The velocity will continue to increase until this um, drag force balances the force causing acceleration. That means still the force of drag, this air resistance or drag, till it balances the weight, okay, the weight of the object, then the velocity stops increasing. And at that point, we say the object has attained terminal velocity, okay? Okay, and that is due to the presence of air molecules in the air. That is due to drag, okay? Yeah, so because of drag, then you can attain terminal velocity. So um, when does an object falling vertically through the air reach terminal velocity? Option A, when the acceleration on the object becomes negative, Option B, when the acceleration on the object is equal to G, no. Option C, when air resistance equal to weight, correct. C is the correct answer to this question. Um, and if you have to plot the, the velocity time graph of the particle, the velocity time graph will look like this, okay? So this will be velocity in meter per second, and this will be time in second, okay? So at this point, then we say we have attained terminal velocity. If not for terminal velocity, ideally, the velocity time graph of this object would look like this. Then the velocity continues to increase indefinitely, okay? But because of air resistance that are present in the atmosphere, then the velocity time graph would not increase infinitesimally, will not increase in to infinity. The velocity radar will not increase to infin infinity, but it will curve at, at the point when, at this point, when it becomes flat completely, then we say we have attained terminal velocity okay good that's it it's easy right yeah of course it's so easy we go straight to question number three an athlete runs 100 meters raised on a straight line in a straight line the table below shows sorry the table shows how his speed changes with time for the first five seconds of the race what is the average acceleration of the athlete between two seconds between time two seconds and time three seconds what do we have as time two seconds? This is the time frame we are picking between two seconds and three seconds. And this is the velocity at two seconds and three seconds. How do we get acceleration? Acceleration is defined as the change in velocity with respect to time. Okay? Or you say divided by change in time. What's change in velocity? The change in velocity will be 5.7 minus 4.1. Yeah, because that's the change in velocity. And what's the change in time? 3 minus 2. Okay, so 3 minus 2. 5.7 minus 4.1 will get 1.6. Okay, 3 minus 2 gives us 1. 1.6 divided by 1, we get 1.6. So the acceleration of the particle is 1.6, which is given by option A. Go straight to question number 4. Question number 4 says the gravitational field strength on the moon is 1.6 Newton per kilogram. An astronaut has the mass of 75 kilograms. What is the weight of the astronaut on the moon? We use the formula for weight. Weight is equal to mass times gravity, okay? That formula is always valid in any planet, okay? So in the moon, the formula is also valid. Weight is equal to mass times gravity. So we write, weight is equal to mass times gravity. The mass is 75 kilograms. Gravity on the moon is 1.6. Do not forget that gravity can be measured in a meter per second square. Okay, it's also measured in newton per kilogram. Okay, so this SI unit here is the same thing. They're talking about gravity and the moon. So 75 multiplied by 1.6, what would that give us? Let's use our calculator for that. 75 multiplied by 1.6, this gives us 120 newton. So our answer is 120 newton. Option C is the correct answer for question number four. We go straight to question five. Two objects P and Q are placed on a beaker containing a liquid. Objects P float in a liquid and object Q sinks. Okay, so let's assume we have a beaker. This is the beaker containing a liquid. There are two objects, object P and um, Okay, should I do object P here? Let me not put object P here. Let me put object P here because object P floats, okay, in the water while object Q does what? Object Q sinks in the liquid, not water. Okay, good. 
So what does this mean? If an object is floating in a liquid, then it means that object is less dense than the liquid. Okay, because the main determination of flotation is density. An object will float in a liquid in wood, um, an object will float in a liquid only if that object is less dense than the liquid. That's why if you put plastic in water, the plastic will float in water. But if you put a metallic bar, a metallic bar, okay, like a gold bar, you put it in water, it will sink because gold is denser than water. It's clear, right? Good. So let us look, let us answer this question. Also, that's why oil is floating in water because oils are less dense than water. So it happens to liquids too. So which row of the densities of P, of object P, object Q, and the liquid is possible? Let's see. Object P, the density is 1.2 gram per centimeter cube. Object Q, 0 0.6. Would object Q be, have less density than P? No. The density of Q should be higher than density of P. So this is not correct. Let's choose option B, 1.2, 1.4. Okay, this looks good because density of Q should be higher than density of P. That's why Q will sink. Look at density of the liquid, 1 gram per centimeter cube. The density of the liquid is less than density of P. So this is not correct. The liquid should be denser than P. That's why P will float. Okay, good. The liquid must be denser than P. Okay, that's the only condition for P to float. If the liquid was less dense, if the density of the liquid was less than density of P, then P will sink. But the question told us that P floats. So this is not correct. Option C, density of P, um, 11.3, Q, 8.9. This is not correct because Q must be heavier than P. Q must be denser than P for it to sink. So let's go. Um, object P, 11.3. Uh -huh. This looks good. Q is denser than P. And the liquid is denser than P. Okay, good. Also, the liquid is less dense than Q. That's why Q will sink. Okay, because Q is denser than the liquid. So Q sinks. P is less dense than the liquid. P floats. So this D is the only one that satisfies those conditions. We go straight to question 6. A ball of mass 0 0.12 kilogram is hit by a tennis player. The velocity of the ball changes from 0 meters per second to 5 meters per second in 0 0.6 seconds. What is the average resultant force acting on the ball while it is being hit? What is the formula for force in this case? Force is equal to mass multiplied by change in velocity divided by time. Okay? Or we say um, change in momentum divided by time. Yeah, change in momentum divided by time. So let's go... Um, this represents change in momentum, mass times change in speed. That's the change in momentum. So, um, what's the mass? The mass is 0 0.12 kilogram. What's the change in speed? The speed changes from 0 to 5. So, 5 is the final velocity. Initial velocity is 0. One divide this by time. The time taken is time is measured in seconds. So, your time is 0 0.6 seconds. So, you put 0 0.6 here. So, now we have um, 0 0.12 multiplied by 5, all divided by 0 0.6. 0 0.12 divided by 0 0.6 gives you, give you 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 multiplied by 12 divided by 6. This gives 0 0.2. 0 0.2 multiplied by 5 gives us 1. So the answer is 1 Newton, which is option A. We go straight to question 6. Okay, so question 6. Let me remove this one so that um, it can be can have enough space to solve. Now, question 6 says. A balloon and a mass are attached to a rod that is pivoted at a fixed point P. So, this point P is a pivot, okay? That simply means this um, rod is free to rotate about this point, okay? That means the, the rod will be free to rotate in a clockwise direction, okay? Also, the rod will be free to rotate in an anticlockwise direction, okay? But when the rod is in equilibrium, um, and balances horizontally, then it's not rotating. Now, let us see what the rest of the question tells us about this um, situation. The question says, the balloon is filled with helium, which is a gas that is less dense than air. So since this is helium, that means the balloon is producing an upward force, and that's what this arrow shows us. The balloon is producing an upward force. The balloon is filled with helium, the balloon filled with helium applies an upward force on the rod. Good. Also, the rod is horizontal and in equilibrium. Which action causes the rod to rotate clockwise? You know, initially the rod was in equilibrium. Okay, that means the clockwise moment that is being produced by this force of the balloon 
is equal to the anti-clockwise moment that is produced by this mass. You know that this mass would produce a downward resultant force that tends to make this rod rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. Okay, but the clockwise moment is balanced by anti-clockwise moment, so they are balanced initially. Okay, now what action will you take in order to make this thing rotate clockwise? Let's see. Moving the balloon to the 40 centimeters mark. So if you bring the balloon to this position, okay, what happened? Take note that when you bring the balloon here, you are increasing the distance between where this balloon is tied. Initially, the balloon was tied here. So the distance from where the balloon is to the pivot was 30 centimeters. Now, when you move the balloon to this point, you have increased the distance from 30 centimeters to 40 centimeters. Okay? And do not forget that moment is equal to force times distance. As you are increasing the distance from 30, you are increasing the distance to 40. Okay? That means you are increasing the moment here. Okay, you are increasing the clockwise moment. Now let's see the second thing you are doing. And mass, you move the mass to the 30 centimeters mark. You know that the mass was initially here. But now if you bring the mass to the 30 centimeters mark, what are you doing? You are increasing the distance. Moment due to the mass is the is the force produced by the mass multiplied by the distance of the mass. Okay. Initially, the distance of the mass was 20. Okay. Now you want to increase it to 30. So as you are increasing the distance from the force. As you are increasing the clockwise moment, okay, you are increasing the clockwise moment by increasing from 30 to 40. You are also increasing the anticlockwise moment by increasing the distance from 20 to 30. Okay, so increasing the anticlockwise moment, you are also increasing clockwise moment. So the beam still remains in equilibrium. Let's see. Moving the balloon to the 20 centimeters mark, okay, so you want to move the balloon to 20 centimeters mark. If you move the balloon to 20 centimeters mark, so you are bringing it here, right? Now, if you are bringing it here, what are you doing? You are reducing the moment, okay? Because you are changing the distance from 30 centimeters to, you are breaking it down to 20 centimeters. And moment is force times distance. Let me separate this. Moment is force times distance, okay? So it will now be force times 20 instead of the initial value of force times 30. So you are reducing the clockwise moment, okay? So let me just make that obvious here. Clockwise moment becomes reduced, okay? Okay, also, um, the, and the mass to the 10 centimeters mark. Now, when we bring this mass to the 10 centimeters mark, what are we doing? If you bring this mass to the 10 centimeters mark, you are reducing the, you are, sorry. Yes, so, you know that the question says, um, what action will make it rotate in a clockwise direction, right? Good. Now, if you bring this mass to the, to the 20 centimeters mark, to the, to the 10 centimeters mark, what are you doing? You're also reducing the distance between the mass and the pivot. Okay? So you are reducing the, the distance between the, the mass and the pivot. So what are you doing to the moment? You know that moment is force times distance. Okay? So that will be force due to the mass multiplied by the new distance will now be 10. That will be the anticlockwise moment. Okay? So you see that the anticlockwise moment has reduced from force times 20 it has reduced to force times 10. While the clockwise moment has also reduced from force times 30, it has reduced to force times 20. So what, what does that mean? That means you have reduced both the clockwise moment and the anti-clockwise moment. So now, how can we analyze this problem and arrive at the best solution to this problem? Now, this is what we have to do. If you continue to shift this one by this distance and try different distances, you won't get a, a satisfying answer, okay? Your answer must be convincing enough. You must be convinced in your answer that you have chosen the correct one. So, now we have to consider the ratio of the distances and express it and express that ratio of distances in terms of the magnitude of the forces. Now take note of this. Initially, this um, system was in equilibrium, and when it was in equilibrium, um, the distance from the force provided by the balloon, let us call the force provided by the balloon FB, and we call the force provided by the mass FM. So um, this force here is the force provided by the balloon. We call it FB, force provided balloon. Then, um, yes, that's the upward force that provides the anticlockwise moment, okay? Then, the force provided by the mass, which tends, sorry, this is the force that provides the clockwise moment. Yeah, you know, this is the clockwise direction, this arrow pointing this way. 
Why the force provided by the mass? Let's call it the force Fm. And this is the force that provides the anti-clockwise moment on, on this rod. Now look at the ratio of the distances. The, ratio, the distance from Fb to the, to the pivot is 30 centimeters. Okay. So if you take the ratio of the distance, the ratio of um, the distance will is, is proportional to the ratio of the forces. So Fb ratio Fm will be what? You know that the distance from F, Fb to the pivot is 30. Why the distance of Fm from the pivot is 20? So Fb ratio Fm will now be will now be the distance with distance of um, Fm ratio the distance of Fb. Okay, yeah. So the the forces the magnitude of the forces is inversely proportional to the distance. Why? Because for a constant value of moment, okay, you know that this beam is in equilibrium, so the resultant moment equals zero. So for a given moment, you know, moment is force times distance. So if you have a given moment, a fixed moment, if you are increasing the force, then you, you have to reduce the distance. You get it? Good. So for a fixed moment, the higher the force, the smaller the distance. You get it? So this one that is at a um, higher distance, and the bigger the distance, the smaller the force. So this force that is at a bigger distance would be proportional to, uh, would, would be expected to have a smaller value than the force that's at a smaller distance from the pivot. That's why we said uh, Fb, which is at a smaller distance, will take the bigger magnitude, okay? So um, that will take the magnitude of 30. Yeah, that will be 30 ratio 20. So that's what we mean by dm ratio db. dm is the distance of Fm from the pivot, which is 20. Sorry. Sorry. dm is the distance of... Um, that will be 20 ratio 30, rather. 20 ratio 30, yeah. dm is the distance of um, Fm from the pivot, which is 20, while db is the distance of Fb from the pivot, which is 30. db is 30, while dm is 20. This is dm, distance of Fm from the pivot, 20. Okay, that's the 20 written here. So, um, you can see this relationship that, that um, the force that's at bigger distance is having smaller value compared to the force that's at a smaller distance. Fm is a smaller distance, is expected to have a bigger value. So this part of um, this expression is of no use, okay? I just need to bring out these values, 20 and 30, so I can just remove it in order to optimize space, to manage space, okay? So that will be 20 ratio 30. What that's, you know, all this um, relationship is simply telling you is that if Fm is 20 Newton, Fb will be 30 Newton. If Fm is 40 Newton, sorry, if Fb is 20 Newton, Fm will be 30 Newton. If Fb is 40 Newton, Fm will be 60, okay, times 2. So that's what this relationship means. Now, from this, we can now solve this problem. Now, let us solve the problem. Let us take these values as the actual magnitude of the forces. So what I'm saying to say is that let's, uh, let's take um, Fb as being equal to 20 Newton, and let us take Fm as being equal to 30 Newton. Now let's solve this problem. Moving the balloon to the 40 centimeters mark. Now if you move Fb to the 40 centimeters mark, okay, and um, and what? And the mass is 30 centimeters mark. If you now move Fm, Fm to the 30 centimeters mark, what will now be the new moment now? You know, um, ideally, for it to be in equilibrium, the moment, the clockwise moment must be equal to moment anti-clockwise, okay, anti-clockwise moment. Let us calculate the clockwise moment now. The clockwise moment becomes Fb multiplied by 40. You know, Fb has now been increased. Sorry, Db, the distance of um, the balloon has now been increased to 40. So let us multiply the force Fb by the distance of 40. So your moment clockwise will now be Fb multiplied by the distance of balloon. What's the force of balloon? Force of balloon, which we, have we are taking our force of balloon to be 20. So you multiply 20 by distance of balloon. Balloon is now at 40 centimeters. 20 multiplied by 40, that will give us 80 Newton meter. Now let us calculate moments anti-clockwise. 
moment anticlockwise will be force of mass multiplied by distance of mass. You know, the question says we should move um, yeah, okay. The mass, the, 30, the mass will be moved to the 30 centimeters mark, yeah. So if you move this mass to the 30 centimeters mark, what will now be the moment? The moment will be force multiplied by the distance. The distance is now 30. What is the mass of, what is the force provided by M FM? The force FM is 30. So the moment will now be the force FM, which is 30, multiplied by the new distance. The new distance is 30. 30 multiplied by 30, that gives us 900. Sorry, this um, answer here is not supposed to be 80. This is supposed to be 800. Yeah, 20 times 40 is 800. So 20 times 40 is 800. So we got 800 Newton meter as the moment clockwise. And we got 900 Newton meter as the moment anticlockwise. So from here, you can see that the anticlockwise moment is bigger than the clockwise moment. Clockwise moment is 800. Anticlockwise moment is 900. So this will not make the beam rotate in clockwise direction. Why? Because anticlockwise moment is bigger. So the beam will rotate in anticlockwise direction. Now let us try it again for the option for the case with of B. Okay. You know, we tried it out for A. A did not work. Okay. Now let's try it with B. In B, you are moving balloon to 20 centimeters mark, and you are moving the mass to 10 centimeters mark. So now let's solve this problem again. Moment clockwise is FB times DB. What's FB? FB is 20. We know that already. What's DB? Distance is the new distance of the balloon now. The distance of the balloon will now be 20. So let us calculate our moment clockwise. Our clockwise moment will be FB, our FB is 20, times DB, distance of balloon, the balloon is now placed at 20 centimeters mark. 20 times 20 gives us 400 as a clockwise moment. Okay, now we are moving the mass to 10 centimeters mark. So that means distance of mass will now be 10. Let's calculate our anticlockwise moment now. Our anticlockwise moment will be force of the mass multiplied by distance of the mass, okay? Just like this equation for clockwise moment. And clockwise moment is provided by the mass. So what's the force provided by the mass? Force provided by the mass is 30. So we have a moment and the clockwise will be 30. Okay, that's force of the mass. Must bye bye. What's distance provided by the mass? Distance provided by the mass, distance of the mass from the pivot rather is 10 centimeters. Okay, we are now moving the mass to the 10 centimeters mark, which is this place, according to the question. So multiply by 10, 30 multiplied by 10 gives us 300. So anticlockwise moment is 300. So you can see that the anticlockwise moment is smaller than clockwise moment. That simply means the beam will rotate in clockwise direction. The question says, which action causes the rod, sorry, rod, not beam, which action causes the rod to rotate clockwise? So this rod will rotate in the clockwise direction when this action in B is taken. Why? Because when you take this action, the clockwise moment will be bigger than the anticlockwise moment. So B is the correct answer. If you try this out with um, moving the balloon to 25 centimeters mark, 25, sorry. If you try this action with moving the balloon to 25 centimeters mark, so we have 20 times 25. So the clockwise moment should give us 500, while anticlockwise moment should give us, um, then um, they are moving the mass to 25 centimeters mark. So that will be 30 times 25. 30 times 25 will give us 750, I think so. So option C, as clockwise moment will be bigger than clockwise moment. If you try it out with D, as clockwise moment will also be bigger than clockwise moment. So that makes B the only correct answer. Okay, so we shade B. So there are some questions like this that will require some analysis that will consume time. Okay, that's why when you are answering multiple choice questions, if you meet a question that is consuming too much time, take note of it and move. Do not solve it, okay? Move to other easier questions. There are so many questions that won't take up to 30 seconds. This question now, this next question should not take up to, how many seconds should this take? Probably 20 seconds or 30 seconds, okay? So it, it's not um, wise when you are spending too much time on questions that consume too much time, when you have not um, solved other questions. So take note of questions that will consume too much time, move, solve other questions. When you are through with solving all the easy questions, then you can return to solving the questions that consume too much time, okay? Because you do not have the luxury of time. Your exam is time bound, 45 minutes to answer 40 questions. That means ideally, you are not supposed to spend more than one minute per question, okay? Why the um, additional five minutes is just um, miscellaneous in, this, in case you need to cross check your answers. Okay, good. So um, let's proceed. Question eight. A hole is made in a square tile of uniform thickness. Uniform thickness. The diagram shows the tile hanging loosely on a nail. 
Where is the center of gravity of the tile? Center of gravity will be at the center of the tile. Why? Because it's of uniform thickness. So we shade option D. So you see, something like this should not consume more than 10 seconds. So it's better to so finish all the easy ones, all the questions that will not consume time, and then you go back to solving the ones that will consume too much time. Number nine. An object of mass 0 0.1 kilogram is moving forward at a speed of 0 0.5 zero meters per second. A second object of mass 0 0.1 kilogram is at rest. The first object strikes the second object. After collision, the second object moves forward at a speed of 0 0.5 meters per second. What is the speed of the object or the first object after collision? You know, solving this question, you have to apply the law of conservation of linear momentum. And according to the law of conservation of linear momentum, um, when um, two objects collide, um, the total momentum after collision must be equal to total momentum before collision. What does that mean? Let us consider the object to be object A and object B. Okay? Object A has a mass MA and object B has a mass MB. Let's assume object A traveling with an initial velocity of UA, okay, while object B traveling with an initial velocity of UB. Now, when these two objects collide, the total momentum before collision must be equal to the total momentum after collision. What's formula for momentum? Mass times speed, okay? So, MAVA, that's momentum of A after collision, plus MBVB, that's momentum of B after collision. Okay? Good. So, this means that total momentum after collision, total momentum before collision is equal to total momentum after collision. This is the momentum before collision. Mass times initial velocity of A, the mass of B, this should be mass of B times initial velocity of B. Okay? So, this gives us initial, velocity, initial momentum, okay? And this is final momentum, okay? Initial momentum refers to the momentum before collision, and final momentum refers to the momentum after collision. So, this is the formula we'll be using to solve this question. Now, let's substitute this formula, okay? Um, let's do that here. Let's use this space. We have enough space here. An object A of mass zero point, an object of mass zero point one kilogram. So let's refer to let's refer to this uh, object A. Okay, object A has a mass of zero point one kilogram. So we have zero point one sorry zero point one six kilogram zero point one six. What's the initial speed of this object? It has the initial speed of um, zero point five meters per second. So that would be our U A zero point five meters per second zero point five. Plus, what's mass of the object B? Uh, a second object is mass 0 0.1 kilogram, 0 0.1 multiplied by what's the initial speed? At rest, that means the initial speed was zero. Okay, that will be equals to after collision, what happened? After collision, the second object moved forward at a speed of the second object, that's our object B. Okay, there was no mention of object A. Let's start with let's focus on object B. Um Hold on, hold on. What is the speed of the first object? Aha. Uh -huh. So you don't have the speed of the first object. The mass remains 0 0.16. 0 0.16. Do you have a speed? No. The speed, the speed is not given to us. So we just write that as VA because you don't have the value. Okay? Plus then MBVB. We are told that after collision, the final speed of the second object is what? The final speed of the second object is 0 0.5 after collision. So our VB will be 0 0.5. So we have um, MB. MB is um, 0 0.1. 0 0.1 multiplied by 0 0.5. So that's how, this is how you solve this problem. Okay? Good. Now let's go. 0 0.16 multiplied by 0 0.5. That will give us um, 0 0.08. Plus... 0 0.1 multiplied by 0 gives us 0, equal to 0 0.16 VA. Of course, that's still 0 0.16 VA. Plus um, 0 0.1 multiplied by 0 0.5, that gives us 0 0.05. You know, it's not necessary for us to write this 0 here. Okay, it's wasting of space. So I'm going to remove it, so in order to optimize the space left. This multiplied by zero gives us zero. Why put the zero here it's if, if it's of no use? So we bring this one here, its sign becomes minus. So we'll be left with um, 0 0.08 minus 0 
Okay, if you take this difference, you should get 0 0.16 VA. 0 0.0 is minus 0 0.05, that will give us 0 0.03. So 0 0.03 should be equal to 0 0.16 VA. How do you get VA? You divide both sides by 0 0.16. Divide by 0 0.16. 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.16, what would that give us? Let's check that here. 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.16. This gives us 0 0.188. 0 0.188. This is an opposite value of 0 0.188. That's 0 0.188. That's equal to VA. So that's the velocity of the first object after collision. 0 0.188 meters per second. Do you have that here? Okay, so B is the closest one. That's 0 0.19 meters per second. So the correct answer to number 9 is B. Let's go straight to question 10. A ball is at rest at the top of a hill. The ball rolls down the hill. So let's just um, put that here. The ball is at rest at the top of a hill, and then the ball rolls down the hill. At the bottom of the hill, at the bottom of the hill, the ball hits a wall and stops. Which energy changes occur? Okay, so let's assume there is a wall here at the bottom of the hill, and at the bottom of the hill, the ball will hit this wall. And once it hits this wall, it stops. Okay, so what happens to the energy of the ball? At the top of the hill, the ball possesses gravitational potential energy. Okay, while as the ball starts rolling down, its gravitational potential energy will convert to kinetic energy. Why? Because the object now has a speed, a velocity v. And kinetic energy is half mv squared. So as long as there is a velocity, then there is kinetic energy. While at the bottom of the hill, all the kinetic energy of the ball will be converted to what? Will be converted to heat. Okay? It's converted to heat, or you call it internal energy. Heat energy is defined as total internal energy of a body. So at the bottom of the hill, it's, it will possess internal energy. Okay? So that's it. And that's what we have here. Gravitational potential energy to internal... No? B. Gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy to internal energy. Yeah. B is the correct answer to question 10. Question 11. A man climbs a ladder which, quanti sorry, which quantities can be used to calculate the power, can be used to calculate the useful power of the man. Right? When you are climbing a ladder, what is happening? As you are climbing a ladder, then you are, you, are, you are gaining gravitational potential energy. So, so which energy can be used to calculate the useful power? Okay, so is that energy that you gain? And do not, do not forget that the formula for power is energy divided by time, okay? Or you define power as the work done divided by time. Either of these two can be used to calculate power. So let's see. The weight of the man, no, we don't need weight. The weight of the man, no, no, no. The work done by the man and the time taken only. Correct. That's the correct answer to that. Work and time will be used. Work divided by time gives us power. Question 12. A student uses a thumb to push a drawing pin that's the thumb tack into notice board. The pin goes into the board, but does not penetrate her thumb. Which statement explains this? Okay, how do you how do you visualize this? And you imagine a thumb pin. I'm sure you all know what the thumb pin looks like, right? So it's being used to, to drive a pin into a notice board. This is the pin. The pin has sharp edges. Then this is the thumb of the student. Okay, so um, this is just a very close resemblance of um, what is happening here. So, yeah, so that's it. So now, sorry about that. Okay, so that's what we have here. That's what we have here. So in a situation like this, what is going on here? So the, this is the thumb of the student, okay, pressing onto the thumb pin. Now look at this. At this edge down here, the cross-sectional area is very small. At this point, the cross-sectional area is very small, okay? While at this point here, the area that is in contact with the thumb is, is com considerably large, okay? It's considerably bigger when compared to the area down there. Do not forget that the formula for pressure is force divided by area. That simply means that if area is large, then pressure will be small. If area is, 
is um, is if area is large for a given force, if area is large, then the pressure will be small. But if area is very small, then the pressure will be high. Let's, for instance, let us consider a force of 100 Newton. Okay, so pressure is force over area. So let us assume, um, okay, since our force is 100 Newton, let's assume a situation whereby the area is as small as um, is as small as 0.02. 0 0.02 meters square. In this case, what will be the pressure? The pressure should be like 50,000 pascals. Am I correct? Am I correct? 100 divided by 2 is 50. That should be 5,000 pascals. Yeah, that's all you have, 5,000. But let us consider a situation whereby the area is big. No, the force remains 100. So let's assume a situation whereby the area is as big as 20. So when the area is as big as 20, what will be the pressure here? The pressure here will just be 5. Okay? Now, compare the pressure when the area is big with the pressure when the area is small. When the area was 20, the pressure was 5. When the, pre when the area was as small as 0 0.02, the pressure is as high as 5,000. What does that tell you? That simply tells you that when the area is very small, pressure will be high. And it's that high pressure that will make this pain penetrate into the, into the um, notice board. Yeah. So the force exerted by the pin on her thumb is great. No, not the force, not the force. See, the pressure of the pin on her thumb is greater than the pressure of the pin on the notice board. No, the pressure of the pin on the notice board is greater. Yes, because it is this part, is this tiny area that makes contact with the notice board. Okay, so the pressure on the notice board is far greater than pressure on her thumb. Why? Because the area is tiny. So the pressure of the pin on the notice board is greater than the pressure of the pin on our thumb. That's the correct answer to this question. Okay, so let me erase this so you can see the answer clearly. Now let's move straight to the next question. Question 13. A submarine is a boat that can travel below the surface of the sea. A submarine is 20 meters below the surface of the sea. The pressure due to the sea water at this depth is P. Another day, the submarine is 26 meters below the surface of fresh water, fresh water in this case. That's the other day. The density of the sea water is 1.3 times the density of fresh water. What is the pressure due to fresh water at the depth of 26 meters? You know, you are told that you should let the pressure due to sea water at the depth of 20 meters, that is be P. Now, we use the expression for calculating density, you know, um, for calculating pressure in liquid, yeah, you know, pressure is density times gravity times height, right? Good. So let us calculate the pressure here. You know, density of water is, um, is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. So let's solve it. So pressure is equal to density, density times gravity times height, right? You know, the density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. That's density of fresh water. 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. So, um, the submarine is 20 meters below surface of sea water. And the density of sea water is 1.3 times the density of fresh water. Okay? So, um, um, let the density of fresh water, let the density of fresh water be equal to 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. In that case, Density of sea water will be 1,300 because it is 1, 1 1.3 times. If you multiply 1,000 by 3, you get 1,300. Now, let us see. What is pressure due to sea water? Pressure due to sea water will be density of sea water times gravity times the height on sea water. Now, let's see. Um, 20 meters below the surface of seawater. Uh -huh. So the height for seawater is 20 meters. Okay. Um, what else? What else? We have the density. We have the density of seawater as 1,300. So let's calculate the pressure of seawater. Okay. Do not forget that P represents pressure. Okay. While this symbol of rho, rho represents density. This is the symbol for density. So the pressure of seawater will be 1,300 multiplied by gravitational field strength on the Earth's surface is 9.8. Multiplied by what's the height in this case? The height, the depth of sea water is 26. Sorry, the submarine is 26 meters below the surface of fresh water. No, 
I'm talking about seawater. 20 meter below the surface of seawater. Uh -huh. The depth for seawater, the height for seawater is 20. So you multiply uh, 1,300 times 9.8 times 20. What will you get? 1,300 times 9.8 times 20. This gives us 254800. 254800. So pressure of seawater is 254800 Newton per meter square. That's pressure of seawater. Okay. And the question tells us that um, the pressure due to seawater at this depth is P. So we are calling this our own P. Okay. Our P is 254,800. Now, you now want to calculate the pressure. They say, what is the pressure due to fresh water at depth of 26? And let us calculate the pressure due to fresh water. What formula? That will be density of fresh water times gravitational field strength, which is 9.8, times the height of fresh water, the depth of fresh water. What's density of fresh water? Density of fresh water is 1,000 kg per meter cube. Gravity remains 9.8. And the depth of fresh water is what? What is the depth of fresh water? The pressure due to fresh water at the depth of 26. So times 26. So we are going to multiply 1,000 times 9.8 times 26. So let's multiply 1,000 times 9.8 times 26. This gives us 254800. So we have um, 254800. Newton per meter square. What do you notice? You notice that the pressure of fresh water is equal to the pressure of seawater. They have the same numerical value, so they are equal. Okay? And the equation already told you that um, um, let let um, sorry, the pressure due to seawater at this depth is P. So we have already taken this value as our P. Okay? And it gave us this pressure of seawater gave us the same value, which is also the same value as our P. That simply means the pressure of seawater will give us the same numerical value. P. P is equal to P. It will be, they will be equal in both cases. Okay. The only difference is that when it is fresh water, that has a, a density of 1,000 kg per meter cube, the height will be 9 points. The height will be 26 years for fresh water. Why, when it comes to seawater, that has a density of um, 1,300 kg per meter cube? the height will be 20, okay? So for seawater that is denser, the height will be less. While for fresh water that is less dense, the height will be more. Yes, for fresh water that is less dense, the height will be more, 26. But for seawater, the height will be 20. That's just the, that's just the case, but it, it will be the same pressure. So let me erase, the, okay? I didn't erase this. Let's just go straight to the next question. Question 20. When particles of a, of a gas collide with a container, the wall experiences a pressure. What is the cause of this pressure? So what is the cause of pressure in a container? That's what's the pressure, what's the cause of pressure in gases? Let's see. Change in energy of the particles, no? Change in momentum of the particles. That's correct. That's correct. Change in momentum of the particles. What does that mean? It's because um, gas molecules have a momentum, which is mass multiplied by velocity. Okay, do not forget that velocity is a vector quantity. That means it has both magnitude and direction. Now, let's assume this gas particle is going to hit this container. Okay, it's going to hit the wall of this container. Okay, so initially, this gas particle has a mass m, let's assume mass of the gas particle, and it has the initial velocity of u. Let's assume initial velocity is m. Um, let's just pick a value of 10 meters per second. Okay, so its initial a momentum will be mass times, times this velocity. Now, after striking, after colliding with this wall of the container, what happens? It bounces back in a different direction. Okay? Its final velocity can be, you know, its initial velocity is taken as 10 meters per second. Its final velocity after collision will be minus 10. Okay? So you see that the velocity has changed. Why? Because direction has changed. Velocity is a vector quantity, so velocity has changed. Okay? And whenever velocity changes, then there is momentum, okay? Momentum is mass multiplied by change in velocity, yeah. Mass times change in velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity. So once velocity changes, then the momentum has changed, yeah. So that's what happens as collision. When gas molecules collide, they bounce back in different direction, and that means they'll be changing 
momentum of the gas. Let's go straight to question number 15. Question 15 says, question 15, a substance can exist in three different states, solid, liquid, or gas. Each of the two statements below describes a change of state. Number one, particles move much closer together but continue to travel throughout the substance. Number two, particles stop traveling throughout the liquid but just vibrate about fixed positions. Which statements, sorry, which changes of states do these statements describe? Number one, condensation melting. What does this particle move much closer together? Okay, that means initially the particles were further apart, but then they come very close together. Okay, and then after that, what's next? Particles move much closer together, but continue to travel throughout the substance. Okay, that should be condensation, the conversion from liquid state, from gaseous state to liquid state. So the first one describes condensation, okay? So only these two are correct for the first one. Then the second one, particles stop moving throughout the substance, but just vibrate about fixed position. That is freezing, okay? It's in the solid state that particles can only vibrate about position, okay? In liquid state, they move freely. But when they stop moving freely, but they just start vibrating about one particular position, then that is conversion from liquid state to solid state, which is freezing, okay? So that's option B, okay? First one is condensation, second one solidification, which is freezing. That makes option B the correct answer to question 15. Question 16. Copper is a, is a type of metal. A copper, sorry, a block of copper has a mass of um, 2 kilogram. That is the mass. A block of copper absorbs 12,000 joules of thermal energy. That is the energy, okay? We can use um, E to represent energy, or we just use Q to represent the thermal energy, the quantity of thermal energy. The specific capacity of copper, we use symbol C to represent the specific capacity, which is 385. What is the temperature rise? You know, the formula for um, quantity of heat is Q is equals to MC times change in temperature. Okay, that's data theta. Now, they are requesting for data theta itself, the change in temperature. So you can just say the change in temperature, change in temperature is the quantity of heat divided by mass times specific capacity. That's all. So you divide the quantity of heat by the mass times specific capacity. What's quantity of heat? The quantity of heat is 12,000. So you divide 12,000 by what? We divide 12,000 by, the mass is two, Space capacity is 385. So you divide it by 2 times 385. You know, that is the same thing as saying 12,000 divided by 2 times 385. That will give us 750. 75, 770. Yeah, I think. So if you divide 12,000 by 770, what will you get? Let's confirm that. Let me multiply this. 2 times 385. 2 times 385. That gives us 770. So now we are dividing 12,000 by 770. And that gives us 15.58. That should be the answer. 15.58. Okay. Option A is the approximate value. 15.58 is approximately 15.6. Question 17. The diagram shows the gap between a hot surface and a cold surface. We have a hot surface, we have a cold surface. This is the gap. What happens to the gap? The gap can contain air, which is a gas, ion, which is a solid, a vacuum, which is um, a space devoid of gases, or water, a liquid. Which material in the gap allows the quickest transfer of thermal energy between the surfaces by the conductor? You know, the fastest conductor of heat energy is metal okay yeah metals good yeah some surface by conduction yeah the fastest conductor of heat energy is metals so we have iron which is a solid okay iron is a metal which is a solid and that's the fastest we go straight to the next one number 18 which hole about boiling and about evaporation is correct okay boiling Boiling takes place only at the surface. That's not correct. Number B. 
Boiling takes place only at the surface. That is not correct. Option C. Boiling takes place throughout the liquid. Correct. Then evaporation takes place only at the surface. Correct. That makes option C the correct answer to question 18. Number 19. Let's calculate at the speed of 2 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second in a glass block. In glass, the wavelength of light is 4.0 times 10 to the power minus 7. What is the frequency? You know, the wave equation states that V equals to F times lambda, where F is the frequency. So if we make F the subject, F is equal to V over lambda. Y V is the velocity and lambda is the wavelength. So velocity is 2 times 10 to the power 8. So you multiply 2 times 10 to the power 8, sorry. We divide 2 times 10 to the power 8 by 4 times 10 to the power minus 7. So 2 divided by 4 will give us 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 10 to the power 8. 8 minus minus 7. That's 8 plus 7, which is 15. And 0 0.5 times 10 to the power 15 is the same thing as saying 5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz, which is option D. 5 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. We go straight to question 20. In a shallow tank, a water wave moves through the barrier with a narrow gap. Here is the narrow gap. The diagram shows waves on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the barrier. Which term describes this effect? Of course, this is diffraction, where waves spread out after passing through a narrow opening. This is diffraction of waves. 20. 21. Which statement describes monochromatic light? Monochromatic light is light that has only one frequency. Okay, light that has only one frequency, okay? So let's see, light that never diffracts, light that has a single frequency. Perfect. Light waves of only one frequency. Question 22. An object is placed 8 centimeters from 18 converging lengths of focal length. We have the focal length as 5 centimeters. Which statement about the image formed by the lens is correct? You see, the distance between the object and the lens is less than twice the focal length, Okay. Focal length is 5 cm. If the object was placed at this point, which is, um, let's assume there's a point here, and the distance from that point here to the beginning is 10 cm. If the object was placed here, then the image will be formed at that same type of position, okay? Okay, but it will be inverted and the same size as the object. Okay, that's if the object was here. But if the object was farther than that, then the image will be very small, okay? The image will be very small, okay? If the object was at infinity, then the image will be at the principal focus, okay? At F, let's assume there's a point here called F. The image will be at F. If the object was here, 2F, image will be at 2F, okay? This same place here. If the object was at F, image will be at infinity. But now that the image is between, object is between um, F and 2F, image will also be, Sorry, yeah, image will be somewhere farther away, okay? You know, um, as object is um, coming closer, the image will be going farther. So, if the object is at F, image will be at infinity. If object goes further away from F, but doesn't get to 2F, image will leave infinity, but it won't get to 2F, but it will be somewhere between 2F and infinity. And um, it will be it should be what? It should be very, very small and still inverted and real. Okay? But it should be very small. So that's what we have here. Image is real inverted. That's correct. I was even thinking there'll be diminished here, meaning it is small. So only A is enough to describe the situation. Okay? Inverted and uh, real. That's correct. A ray of light travels through transparent plastic to air. This is air, transparent plastic. The light is coming from plastic and it's going to air. The ray of light enters the air, traveling parallel to the surface. That means um, here, if the ray of light is imagined as this, that means the angle of refraction will be 90 degrees. You know, if we produce this normal, and we have um, this, this will be the angle of refraction, which will be 90 degrees. This simply means that we have um, critical angle. That means the angle of incidence here. The angle of incidence here is the critical angle. The refractive index of, of plastic is 1.25. What is angle theta? You know, in a situation like this, we say sin theta is equal to 1 over refractive index. Yeah, 
where theta is the angle of incidence, okay? Okay, you can call it sin i because theta, theta is angle of incidence, okay? I can also decide to call it sin c because the angle of incidence at this point is critical angle. The angle of incidence when the angle of refraction is 90 degree is called the critical angle, okay? Good, so let's see. Okay, so let's just use theta because the question refers to it as theta. So sin theta is equal to 1 over refractive index, okay? That means sin theta is equal to 1 over... What's our refractive index? Our refractive index is 1.25. 1.25. 1 divided by 1.25 will give us... Um, that should be 0 0.8. Yeah, 0 0.8. So we have sin theta is equal to 0 0.8. Good. So how do you get the value of theta? Theta must be equal to shift sin 0 0.8. So you press shift sin 0 0.8 on your calculator. Okay? You get um, their answer. So let's see. Let's press shift sin 0 0.8. Um, that will be sin sin raised to the power of minus 1. I hope this will work. Ah, 0 0.8 degrees. Okay, I've tried it before. Sin raised to the power of minus 1. Okay, that's arc sin 0 0.8. And that gives you 53.13. Yeah, that's it. 53.13. Do you have 53? Yeah, D. 53 degrees. That's the right answer to question 23. We go straight to question 24. What is the speed of electromagnetic waves in vacuum? All electromagnetic waves in vacuum, they have the same speed, which is 300 million million meters per second. Okay, but in this case, we are given in kilometers per second, we have centimeters per second. So which one will it be? If you convert um, 300 million meters to kilometer, it becomes 300,000 kilometer per second. Okay, if you are converting 300 million meters to centimeter, it becomes 300000000. 000000000 centimeters per second so that's just on unit conversion convert the SI units of numerator okay okay convert a meter to centimeter it means you multiply by 100 if you multiply this value by 100 you get 30 billion centimeters per second do you have 30 billion here no do you have um if you convert 300 million to kilometer if you convert 300 million meter to kilometer just divide by 1000 you get 300,000 kilometer per second do you have 300,000 kilometer per second here yes Kilometer per second. 300,000 300, means 3 times 10 is power 5. Why? Because there are 5 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's 3 times 10 is power 5. This is the correct answer to question 24. If you are tired, you can pause this video and continue, continue later, okay? You don't have to finish everything once and for all, okay? And then before doing that, please ensure you subscribe to this channel and please like this video. Then you give your comments. If you want, if you prefer me to break this video into smaller sections, please say it in the comment section so I don't keep producing things that um, that are tiring. Okay, let's continue. Number twenty-five. A pulse of sound is produced at the bottom of a boat. So this is the boat. This is the pulse of sound producing sound waves. Then sound travels through the water and is reflected from the seabed. So once the water sound waves reach the seabed, then it bounces back. It's reflected back to the boat. The sound reaches the boat again after 1.3 seconds. Okay, the seabed is 1,000 meters below the boat. Using this formation, what is the speed of sound in water? And the formula for speed of sound is the total distance. That's formula for speed, distance divided by time. But you are told that this, it took 1.5 seconds for the sound to reach the boat again. That means the sound waves left the boat went to the bottom of the seabed, okay? After hitting the bottom of the seabed, what happened? The sound waves then bounced back and returned to the boat again. That was when the ultrasonic sensors now sense the waves, that the waves have gone and they have come back, okay? Good, that means um, the total distance traveled by the, the, by the sound waves now is twice the depth, okay? That's why you always write two times here, okay? To indicate twice the depth. That's how you calculate speed whenever the reflection of sound wave is involved. And that is called echo. Whenever you are dealing with echo, you use twice the distance. So two times the distance is 1,000 meters, and the time taken is 1.3 seconds. Two times 1,000 gives you 2,000. 
And 2,000 divided by 3 will give us what? Let's do that here. 2,000 divided by 3. 2,000 divided by... It's not 3. It's 1.3. 2,000 divided by 1.3 gives us 1538. 1538. Let's see. Do you have 1538 here? We have a value approximately 1538, which is 15,000 meters per second. That's close enough. We pick C as the correct answer to question 25. We go straight to question 26. A sheet of ice floats on water. The source of sound S is positioned at the edge of ice. This is the source of sound. As position at the edge of the of ice sheet. It's positioned at the edge of the ice sheet. Four microphones are placed equal distances from S. Equal distances. So the distance from S to this microphone was equal to the distance from S to this microphone. Distance, equal distances. Okay. okay. Which microphone detects the sound from S first? You know, the distances are equal, okay? So, where do you have um, the smallest distance? The smallest distance occur when the speed is greatest. Sorry, the smallest time, rather, okay? Okay, you know, speed is distance divided by time. That simply means time is distance over speed. So, when the speed is very, very high, automatically time becomes very small. You know, when the denominator is high, the value of the entire expression will be small. When the denominator is very small, the value of the expression will be high. So we are looking for when speed will be very, very high. Which of these mediums has the highest speed? It is solid. Sound travels fastest in solid. Okay? Okay, yeah. And the speed of sound in water is about 1,500 meters per second. Speed of sound in air is about 300. Yeah. Compare 300 to 1,500. But as for solid, speed of sound in solid is, is in order of um, like around... 4,000 or something like that. I'm sure of iron. In, in iron, speed travels as far as 5,000 meters per second in iron. Okay, I'm not sure about the value for ice, but if you Google the value for ice, I'm sure it will be a very high value. Okay, in order to conserve time, let's move to another question. I don't know if my internet is fast enough. Uh -huh. So what value do we have here? We have um, 3,882 meters per second. You see, that's very high value. Okay, 3,800. Okay, so question 27. The diagram shows a bar magnet and four plotting compasses. Which compass correctly shows the direction of the magnetic field due to the magnet? Magnetic lines of force, they run from the North Pole to the South Pole. That's what magnetic lines of force are. They go from the North Pole to South Pole. So we use arrows to indicate the lines of force leaving the North Pole, okay, the lines of force go this way, okay? Take note of the direction of the arrow, okay? And then the, the lines of force will return to the magnet through the south pole. Good. So this line of force will return to the magnet through the south pole. So which one it looks correct? This is, is opposite the direction because the line of force is going this way, okay? It's going this way. Yeah. Okay, this doesn't look neat. Let me erase that and fix it. So if you look at um, the direction of a um, magnetic lines of force, this diagram does not, um, the first one does not correctly depict it because you see it's in opposite direction to the, this direction of the field, okay? And the arrow, arrow is pointing in opposite direction. While in the third case, the, the lines of force, you see lines of force return through the south pole. So the D is the only arrow that's pointing in the right direction of the lines of force. So you pick option D as the correct answer to that question. That is clear, right? Eh? Good, of course, that is clear. Understood? Of course, understood. We move straight to the next question. Question 28. A plastic rod is rubbed with a cloth. The rod becomes positively charged. What happens to the plastic rod and what happens to the charge on the cloth? You see, when you rub a plastic rod on a cloth, and the question says the rod becomes positively charged. If um, the rod is becoming positively charged, what is happening? This simply means electrons are leaving this rod and they are moving to the cloth, okay? That's why the rod becomes positively charged, okay? Once negative charges leave the rod, then the resultant charges that will be left on the rod will be positive, positive charges. That's why the rod becomes positively charged, okay? And take note that it simply means electrons have left the rod and they have migrated to the cloth. That's why the rod will be left with a net positive charge. So let's see. 
the plastic rod gains electrons, no, loses electrons, correct. Um, charge on the clothes, negative, that's correct. That makes option C the correct answer to question 28. It goes straight to question 29. The electromotive force F of a mobile phone battery is 3.7 volts. What does this mean? Do not forget that electromotive force is defined as the work done per unit charge. Okay, okay, or you say energy dissipated per unit charge. Okay, so we divide the energy by the charge of the electron. So let's see what we have here 3.7 joules is the maximum energy the battery can provide in one second. No, 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 it's not energy per unit time. 3.7 joules is the total energy the battery can provide before it has, it has to recharge. No, no, that's not good enough. 3.7 joules is the sorry, 3.7 joules of energy. Is provided by the battery to drive a charge of one coulomb around the complete circuit. That's correct. That's energy by unit charge. Energy is measured in joules. Charge, point of charge is measured in coulomb. That makes question um, option C the correct answer to question 29. Let's go straight to question 30. A computer engineer wants to wants the speed of a fan to increase when the temperature. When the temperature inside a computer increases, the engineer knows that a larger current causes the fan to turn more quickly. Which component should be placed at X to make this happen? You know, when the, when the current is large, the engineer knows that larger current causes the fan to turn more quickly. And when the fan is turning more quickly, what happens? The rate at which the computer will cool will be faster. Yes. That's to make the computer cool down faster. That's what um, computer engineers put into consideration whenever they are de designing a machine. Okay, good. So the power supply, we have X. So which components would ensure that when the temperature is high, it will allow more current to pass through it. And when the temperature is low, it will allow little current, okay? Yeah, so when temperature is high, it will allow more current to pass through. And that's plenty current will make sure the fan turns faster and cools down the, the computer faster. And when temperature is low, the this X will ensure little current passes through. So the fan will be turning slowly because it does not need to, to push in more air through the computer. So the best component for that is, is what? Is a thermistor. Because the thermistor is a device that its resistance will reduce when temperature is high. So when temperature is high, the resistance of the thermistor will reduce. That means the total resistance in the circuit will be very small and large currents will flow through. Why? Because current is voltage divided by resistance according to Ohm's law. Okay, yeah. So when the resistance of the thermistor becomes low, total resistance in the circuit will be low and large currents will flow through. Okay, good. And that's what the, that's the job of the thermistor. A relay will just um, help to... It helps to switch... Is as a switch, okay. It's just to use you use a small current to control a large um, current source, okay, or use a small voltage source to switch a larger voltage source. Why the transformer is used for for you step up or you step down the voltage in a circuit. Variable resistor is just a resistor whose value can be changed, whose resistance can be changed. Number thirty-one: a water heater is connected to a two hundred and thirty volt supply. And there is a current of um, 26 amperes in the heater. It takes 20 minutes to heat the water to the required temperature. How much energy is supplied by the heater? Do not forget that the formula for electrical energy, the formula for electrical energy is equal to IVT, where I is the current, V is the voltage, T is the time. Do not forget that your time must be expressed in second and not in minutes. So electrical energy, electrical energy is I, I is the voltage, I is the current, what's the current? The current here is 26 amp, we have 26 times V is the voltage, the voltage here is 230 volts, multiplied by T is the time, what's the time here? The time here is 20 minutes, convert to seconds, so you have to multiply this 20 by 60, that's how you convert to seconds. If you multiply these three values, 26 times 23 times 20 times 60, Twenty six times twenty three times twenty times sixty seven one seven six zero zero seven one seven six zero zero seven one seven six zero zero. 
That's approximately seven, seven, two, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, zero, 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 zero. Yeah. And that can be expressed as 7.2 times 10 to the power, times 10 to the power what? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, seven point two times ten to the power five. Is that what you have here? What you have here is seven point two times ten to the power six. Let's check if you made a mistake. Twenty six times two thirty. Okay, I wrote twenty three here. It shouldn't be twenty three. It should be two hundred and thirty. Okay, that's the mistake I made. So when you are pushing your calculator, make sure you don't make mistakes. Seven one seven six zero zero zero. So you have seven one seven six zero zero zero, and that will give us. Hold on, let me fix this. That's seven one seven six zero zero zero, and that will give us seven um, two zero 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 zero. So if you want to write in standard form, you should the decimal point one two three four five six. You should see six times. That's seven point two times ten to the power six. Option D. So you go to question thirty two. An electric kettle has a metal casing. The cable for the kettle contains a wire that is connected to Earth to earth plug of the pin, sorry, to earth pin of the plug. Which danger does this um, guard against? So usually, in this case of electric kettle, you can consider a, a wire that is connected to the earth. And where does that earth normally go? The earth normally connects to the casing, the container of the gadget. Why? Because if for any reason, let's assume um, the power supply supplies a large current, and um, the device is malfunctioning. Probably one metal is touching the container from any parts of the device. Then this device begins to electrocute. If anybody touches it, okay, let's assume a student touches it, the student will be electrocuted because the casing of the device is, has been energized, okay? But when you edit it this way, whenever there is a danger of um, that can lead to electric electrocution, that current will flow through this earth cable to the ground. So the students will not be electrocuted. And that is the danger that earth can help us to overcome. So which danger does this guard, guard against? The cable of the kettle becoming too hot. No, the casing of the kettle becoming live. Yes. Okay, so you, it prevents the casing from becoming a live wire. That is what the earth does. Question 33. An electric current can produce a heating effect and a magnetic effect. Which role shows the effect that a relay uses? And one application of a relay. Okay, a relay is a device that helps us to switch a larger um, voltage using a smaller voltage source. Okay, and that involves magnetism. We need a magnetic field for that. So it's a magnetic effect, not a heating effect. And watch application, align a small coin to switch larger coin. That's correct, okay? So a relay is used, you use a smaller coin to switch larger coin. Or you say use a small voltage to switch a larger voltage. That makes it the correct answer to question 33. Question 34. The diagram shows a bar magnet and a coil of wire. The bar magnet is moved in the same speed in each experiment. Okay, it's moved at the same speed in each experiment. In which situation is the largest electromotive force, EMF induced? Okay, so EMF will be induced here when you move the coil into the core, when you move the magnet rather into the coil, the coil will be induced. Okay, whether you are moving it into or you are moving it away. And take note that it is the magnet is moved at the same speed in each experiment. So since the speed is the same thing, then the same current will be induced in both cases. But here, as you are moving the current, as you are moving the magnet into the coil, you're also moving the coil into the towards the magnet. That means the relative speed here, the relative velocity here, will be the velocity as which you are moving the coil plus the velocity as which you are moving the magnet. Okay, yeah. In this case, in the first case, the relative speed, relative velocity will just be velocity as which you are moving the magnet. The same thing here. The relative velocity will be velocity as which you are moving the magnet. In the last case, you are moving both of them in the same speed, okay? Moves at the same speed as the bar magnet. So the relative velocity will be velocity as which you are moving the core minus velocity as which you are moving the magnet. Since the velocities are equal, here you get zero. While in the first case, since the velocities are equal, you get two times velocity as which you are moving the 
magnet, okay, because um, they are equal to each other. So the velocity here it strikes the velocity in each of these cases. So more currents will be generated here. The currents will be generated there will be zero. So this is one that produces more current. In which station is the largest locomotive force produced? This is when the largest locomotive force is induced. Option C. That makes option C the correct answer. So I will erase this so you can clearly see the option I'm picking. So we pick option C as the correct answer to question 34. We we'll go straight to question 35. Increasing the transmission voltage in transmission cables reduces power losses. What is the explanation for this um, reduction? Do not forget that um, formula for power, electrical power, is what? Is what? I squared. Sorry. Yes, I squared R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, power is equal to IV, right? Power is equal to IV. And from Ohm's law, this V itself is equal to IR. Okay, so instead of having V here, you can replace this V with IR. So we say power is equal to I multiplied by IR. So instead of writing V, you are writing IR. Okay, good. I multiplied by IR, that gives us I squared R. This is the formula for power loss. Okay, so now your, your transformer will do what? Since power is equal to I squared R, your transformer would match down this um, current, try to reduce this current, okay, to, the, to a very low level. So that when, once current reduces, then the energy lost as a result of this current will be extremely small. For example, let's assume you are reducing the current from um, 100 amperes. You are trying to reduce it to 1 amperes. 1 ampere. When the current was 100 amperes, how do you get the power loss? Okay, Power loss in this case will be I squared R. 100 squared will give us 10,000, okay? That's 10,000 R. That's the power loss. See how large the power loss is. But why, when the, the current is 1 ampere, what will be the power? Power loss will be I squared R. 1 squared is equal to 1. That will be 1 R. So you see the difference. Compare 10,000 R with 1 R. So the power, has, power loss has been reduced, okay? Good. So the current decreases, reducing thermal energy losses. That makes A the correct answer, okay? Take note that the transformer reduces, it steps down the current, okay? Okay? Yeah, in transmission line, when you want to transmit power, you are, you are stepping up the voltage in order to transfer, transmit. So as you are stepping up the voltage, automatically you are stepping down this current. So stepping down the current would drastically reduce the value of I squared, okay? Yeah, it drastically reduce the value of the power loss, I squared. So that is it. Just from the mathematical expression, you can explain every, almost every concept. Question 36. There's an electric current in a straight wire in the direction into the page. This produces a magnetic field around the wire. So this is a wire, okay? This um, X here shows that current is flowing into the page, okay? Good. And why this represent the um, lines of force of the magnetic field around the wire. All field lines are circles, but only one field line is shown. Only one field line is shown. There are other field lines that are not shown here. Which row describes the magnetic field? The direction of field lines are anticlockwise. No, no. If current is going this way, the direction of field lines will be in the clockwise direction. Why? Because that is in line with the right hand rule, okay? Or you call it the corkscrew rule. That if you have a conductor and you grab it with your right hand, okay? Let's assume the direction in which the thumb is pointing, in pointing represents the direction of the current. So current flows in this upward direction. Then the direction of in which the fingers wrap around this conductor represents the direction of the magnetic lines of force. Okay, so that's what we have here. Okay, good. So this represents the direction of magnetic lines of force. Okay, so if I turn my hand, whichever way I turn my hand, this direction represents the magnetic lines of force. So if you see here, if the conductor, if my thumb points in the direction of current, then look at the direction of my fingers. It shows that the, the field lines is going in the clockwise direction, okay? Considering current that is moving into the field. So let's see, um, direction of field lines and clockwise, no, that's not correct. Clockwise, that's correct. 
you call it space over the whole field. No, more wipe this space further away. That is correct because now this one thing about electric, electric, electric um, magnetic lines of force around the wire. They will be closer together, close to the conductor. And the further you go, the more the distance. Okay, so the next one will be as wide as this. The next one can be as wide as this, very wide. Okay. So the further you go, the wider the distance. That simply means the strength of the magnetic field produced will reduce as you are moving away from the core of the conductor. That is what that represents, okay? That's what that depicts. Question 37. The diagram shows emissions from a source passing into electric field between two charged plates. So some radioactive um, emission um, um, were ejected here one of them moves straight without being deflected by the electric field, while the other one was deflected by the electric field. Take note that this one that is deflected moves towards the positive plate, okay? It moves towards the negative plate, rather, okay? So if something is moving towards the negative plate, that means that thing must be positively charged. That's why it was moving close to the positive plate. That's why it was moving clo close to the negative plate, sorry. Yeah, if something is moving, is being attracted, by the negative plate, that means that thing is positively charged, yeah? Good. While if something is not affected by the field, that means that thing has no charge, okay? Take note that alpha particle is a helium nuclei, He2+, okay? Helium uh, that has a charge of plus 2. Beta particle is an electron, negatively charged. While gamma rays has no charge, no charge at all. There's no charge on gamma rays. So gamma rays are not being if affected by electric field neither are they affected by magnetic field so this one that goes undeflected is definitely a gamma ray why this one that is affected by the negative plates must be an alpha particle that's why it was pulled by the alpha particle so we have alpha particle we have gamma rays let's see what do you have here alpha particle beta particles no alpha particles gamma rays only c is the correct answer to question 37 we go straight to question 38 newtons of course you don't have newtons here Okay, neutrons. Okay, can this be a neutron and gamma ray? No, we can't. We have neutron and gamma rays. Okay, yeah, yeah. Of course, you can have neutron and gamma rays because neutron will not be affected because neutron has no charge, so neutron will not be affected by this field. Also, gamma ray will not be affected by this field. So it was neutron and gamma ray. Both of them would point straight without being deflected. Okay, but in this case, one one straight, why the other was deflected. So it can't be neutron and gamma ray. So it can't be A. So this is the correct answer. We go straight to question 38. We're almost through with this. Which row in the table describes the process of nuclear fusion and identifies the change in total mass of the particles involved? Okay, um, when you hear nuclear fusion, what, what does that, what does that um, mean? That is when two smaller nuclei fuse together okay when they come together to form what to form a bigger nuclei and that is what happened what is happening in the sun yeah we have um, hydrogen hydrogen fuse together to form helium nuclear fusion yeah so let's see a larger nucleus splits nodes, larger nucleus splits nodes, two small nuclei combined to form a larger nucleus, yes. Then the change in mass, the total mass will decrease. Yes, there will be a very tiny, okay, there will be an infin infinitesimal change in mass, of course. Why? Because um, energy is equal to mc square. So for energy to be released, there will be a change in mass okay that change in mass that is what causes the energy but that change in mass is very very small but that does not overrule the fact that there will be change in mass so c is the correct answer because mass will decrease then it means then the nuclear fusion also means that two smaller nuclei combine together to form a bigger and heavier nuclei that's all for question sorry there, yeah that's all for question 38 now I'm going to question 39. Oh, I need this space to solve. So I have to remove all of this so I can solve question 39. Now question 39 says, we'll read the question together. The orbit of the moon around the Earth is molded as a circular part of radius 3.8 times 10 to the power 5 
kilometers. The orbital period is 29.5 days. That's 710 hours. This one has already been calculated for you. You don't need to calculate it. Okay, so you don't need this 29.5 days. What you just need is 710 hours. Yeah, that's the time in hours. Okay, so what else do we have? What is the orbital speed of the moon? We need the speed in kilometers per hour. We, are, we have the radius as 3.8 times 10 to the 5 kilometers. We have the time as 710 um, hours. Um, what is the speed? How do you get speed? The formula for calculating speed is distance divided by time. What is the distance now? You know, it is modeled as a, as a, as a circle, okay? So it is considered to be moving around the circular part, okay? And what is the radius of the circular part? Radius is distance from the center to the circular part. And we're giving the radius as what? As 3.8 times 10 to the power 5. Since it's, yeah, since it's moving along the circular part, then the total distance will be the distance of a circle, which formula is given by 2 pi r, okay? That's the formula for a circular part. So the formula for the circle is 2 pi r, okay? Yeah, the distance is, will be the circumference of this circular part. And we use 2 pi r to calculate the circumference of the circular part. Then divide by our time, our time is 710. Let's solve 2 times pi is um, 22 over 7, or you write 3.142 times the radius will be 3.8 times 10 to the power 5. Now we divide all of these by our time, which is 710. Now let's stop. 2 by 3.8 times 10 to the power 5. 2 times pi is 22 over 7. 22 divided by 7. 2 pi. Then the radius is 3.8 times 10 to the power 5, right? Uh, that is 380000. Yeah, that's mean of 3.8 times 10 to the power 5. Then we divide all of these by our time. Our time is 710. How did it get um, 380000? Okay, that's how we're talking about here. We got 380000 because 3.8 times 10 to the power 5. 3.8, let me put that here. 3.8 times 10 to the power 5 is equal to, you know, 3. It's that decimal point, we shift it to the right five times, okay? Why we fill all these blank spaces with zero? Yeah, that means we have 380000, and that's what I used here, okay? I used them um, 380000. So I got them um, 3364, 3364. 3,364 kilometer per hour. So let's put that in in two significant figure, okay? And we expect a standard form. Especially in standard form, you shift your decimal point to the right thrice. So you'll be left with 3.364, 364, times 10 is the power 3, okay? And that's approximately 3.4 times 10 is the power 3, okay? Yeah, that's 3.4 approximation. This is the correct answer to this question. We move straight to question 40. Question 40 says, hold on. Question 40 says, which statement does not describe, does not describe redshift? Which statement does not describe redshift? Number one, all light emitted from all distance galaxies is at the red end of the spectrum. Can light emitted from a distance galaxy be at red end? That means, um, let's assume this is a galaxy made up of the star and every other thing in it. And let's assume this is a distant galaxy. Okay? So, according to this, it means um, light emitted from all distant galaxies. That means the light that is coming from here is already redshifted. No. The light that is emanated, that emanates from this galaxy is not redshifted. The light emanating from this galaxy can be any color of light, okay? Any color uh, among um, within the visible spectrum. But as the light is going towards the our own galaxy, then um, because this galaxy itself is moving away at a high speed, okay? Since it's moving away, and yeah, you know that's the concept that says um, the universe is again uh, is um, expanding because the galaxy is cons constantly moving away at a high speed. So it means this ray of light that I've drawn here 
will stretch further. It will stretch. Yeah, it will stretch. And as it stretches, the wavelength increases. That increase in wavelength means the frequency is dropping. Good. That increase in, in wavelength means the frequency is dropping. I know the colors of um, electromagnetic spectrum. We have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. This violet has the highest um, frequency, while red has the lowest frequency, okay? So remember I said the, the light ray will stretch because the universe, the, the galaxies are moving, they are, the, distance are, 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 uh, the distance between them is increasing, so they are separating further and further away from each other. So as that light is made to stretch, then it means the wavelength is increasing. And that increase in wavelength means the frequency is reducing. Yeah, it means the frequency is reducing. Why does that mean the frequency is reducing? Because according to wave equation, V equals to F lambda. V equals to F lambda. Yeah, so since the speed is constant, if the, if the wavelength is increasing, then frequency will reduce. And do not forget that red has the lowest frequency. So frequency will, would have dropped to the red portion of the electromagnetic spectrum before it gets to us. Okay, that is red shifting. Okay, so all light uh, emitted from all distance galaxies are at the red. No, they are not at the red when they are emitted. Okay, they only get to the red when they get to our own galaxy. Okay, so this does not describe redshift because the light that is em emitted from distance galaxy is not redshift is not redshifted, okay? Emitted means giving it out. So it does not give out light that is redshifted. The light, it gives out normal light, but the light would have become redshifted before getting to us, okay? That makes the one, this A is the only one that does not describe redshift. Every other thing describes redshifting. Light arriving at Earth from receiving star, from receding star is always redshift. Yeah, receding star, that stars are moving far away from us, always redshift, that's correct. Doing redshift, Wavelength of the observed light is longer. Yes, because the light would stretch. Okay, so the wavelength increases. Yeah, wavelength of the receding star is always... During redshift, wavelength of the observed light is longer than it if the redshift had not occurred. Yeah, wavelength will be longer than it would be if the redshift had not occurred. Why? Okay, this, so the light from stars in all distant galaxies is moved towards the red length of the of the spectrum, of course, the light stars are distant galaxies because all distance, all the galaxies they are moving further, they are moving further away from galaxies that are at the edge are moving further away from galaxies that are closer to the center of the universe. So all distance galaxies that are further away from the center of the universe are moving further away. That means them lights that are coming from them before getting to our own galaxies they would have become red shifted. Yeah, so that's it. Um, and guess what that brings us to the end of this okay okay so you are there are other videos that you can watch please ensure you you comment on this okay if it's good enough and if there are adjustments you want me to make to this if you want me to make the video shorter you want me to break it down into five five question one to five six to ten um eleven to fifteen like that if it will make it more interesting just comment okay just say something about this video i need to get your feedback I've not been getting feedback. I need your feedback. Thank you for watching. Um, I wish you the best of all in your exam. Do have a nice day. Goodbye.